Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Associate Professor Eric Anderson. He's at Northwestern. And we're going to talk about uh, quantitative and molecular genetics that he's using to understand, uh, you know, people's traits, how they respond to medicines, how they respond to the environment, um, you know, what traits they have, et cetera. So, Eric, thanks for coming. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. I may have been uh, too simplistic. If you wouldn't mind, uh, what, what, in your mind, in your words, what's your research about? Yeah, so, so I'm interested in kind of one of these the big questions in genetics today, which is if we could sequence a genome and then read it like a book, can we predict or understand the phenotype of an organism based upon reading that genome? So by that I mean, if we forget, let's say, your genome sequence and my genome sequence, we compare them to each other, would we be able to predict you know, how long we would live, the types of drugs that we could take that would be most efficacious towards treating certain types of diseases, uh, whether we're predisposed to other diseases, uh, and so on. And uh, this is a difficult and interesting problem to do within humans. Uh, so in my lab, we focus on uh, using roundworm nematodes from the center of genome genus uh, that allow us to be able to make these uh, connections between genomes and different traits within the organism more easily. Well, how do you know that um, a, a given sequence of RNA or DNA will lead to a certain trait that's kind of like figuring out the, uh, I guess, the language of RNA or DNA. Does that, has that worked in any organism thus far? Yeah, so, so the, the differences in our DNA that we all have across the population, uh, in, in, in many respects, the, the trait that we're talking about is, is controlled by genetic differences and by environmental differences that the, that the person or organism may have encountered during their life. So we're, we're focused specifically on the genetic changes. And there have been numerous examples, not just in uh, C. elegans, worms, or in any in flies, yeast, um, all the way up to humans, where we can take genetic differences in a population. Again, these little these little sequence changes that occur from person to person or from organism to organism, and we can do correlations to figure out when those genetic uh, differences are are correlated with some trait difference across a population. So let's say type two diabetes risk, uh, height. Uh, for humans, those are two good examples or examples that are often touted. In, in C. elegans, we've been focusing on responses to different types of drugs, chemotherapeutics, toxins, uh, and so on. Uh, but yeah, that, so that, that's the, what we do is we look for um, differences in the DNA that, that you're right, they might end up being uh, transcribed into differences in the mRNA, and those might be translated into differences in the protein, uh, but we're ultimately getting them, chasing them down to differences in the DNA and connecting that to uh, to difference in the phenotype. Well, are there certain changes that tend to, I mean, correlate? And uh, I would think there's there's tons of, of noise. It'd be very hard to do the right experiment that would correlate properly. Yeah, so so it is difficult, but this is uh, where the field of quantitative genetics uh, comes into play, where essentially you uh, look at the correlation between uh, every particular variant of interest in the genome and with your trait of interest. and a lot of times you'll find that there are some regions of the genome of which there are many variants in that region that are correlated with your trait of interest. And typically that's where quantitative genetics often stops is, is as you just said, it's, it's difficult. There are a whole lot of variants that can be correlated. So the, a lot of times quantitative genetics stops just with that correlation. And I think the advantage of using some genetic systems like let's say yeast or worms is that we can essentially grow large populations of individuals and we can mix up their genomes using genetic crosses that allow us to break those correlations that exist within a natural genome to be able to further refine the correlations and narrow it down even more to find the particular gene and then within the particular gene the exact change in the dna that's correlated with your phenotype of interest so 
you're right, it's a very large problem. You start with millions of changes across the genome. And in a typical mapping experiment, you can reduce those millions down to a few hundred variants or a few hundred positions around the genome that might be correlated with your trait of interest. And then it takes some either uh, clever statistics or uh, essentially crosses and further genetics in the lab to be able to, to break those hundreds down to the one or a very small number of variants that could be correlated with your trait of interest. Are you seeing strong correlations or very weak correlations so far in the nematodes? Yeah, so, so because of the way that these, the, these, the quantitative genetic experiments typically work, um, it's a statistical test, and all statistical tests are affected by the powers or the ability to be able to detect um, a significant signal from all of the noise. So what, when we do identify a signal, um, in those cases, it, it's often a, a strong effect on the trait of interest. So typically um, in, in the, the mappings in our lab where we're looking at this correlation of the genetic differences to the phenotypic differences, we, we see that, um, that the, the genetic change will control between 20 and 80 percent of the difference across the, of that population. So those are considered very large uh, effects. If you were to look at the typical mapping that might occur within the human population or the typical correlation test in humans, uh, the largest effects that have been found are in the you know, five to 10% uh, range. So the, what we can identify in, in nematodes um, is actually similar to what can be identified within yeast or in the, the, the uh, plant called the Rapidopsis thaliana. Um, and in both of these systems, uh, we're able to identify uh, much larger effects than what's possible in humans. And the reason why we probably see these much larger effects in our organisms versus humans is that we have the ability to grow up a large number of individuals that are all genetically identical to each other. So uh, the nice thing about C. elegans is that they're selfing hermaphrodites, so they make both sperm and egg. So it just takes one individual, and that individual will mate with him, uh, will mate with herself, to be able to generate a large number of ident genetically identical offspring. Um, and yeast and Arabidopsis can do the same thing. Um, so that means that when we are testing this correlation of genotype and phenotype, we've got really uh, exquisite control over that phenotype. We know that um, the individuals that we're measuring phenotype, they are genetically identical. So the only thing that we're really looking at differences would be uh, the noise that would come from the experimental setup. And, and there's lots of really good statistics to control for those differences. Um, uh, in phenotype across the population. So um, when you when you've uh, bred a, a given nematode, you know, well, it's not asexually. I don't know what you call it, monosexually, but uh, you know, with itself, and you do many many generations. Do you see any, you know, the theory of beneficial mutations? Do you see that uh, happening at all? Yeah. So so laboratory evolution experiments, is which you're referring to there. So so essentially uh, looking at um, the individuals after a long-term selection experiment, let's say, where you give them a little bit, you start out with a, a population of individuals that are genetically uh, the same, and then you can either uh, let evolution run its course, where they, they gain additional mutations over time, and then look to see if they're phenotypically different at the, at the end of some period of time. Um, people have done those experiments in, uh, in nematodes. And my lab doesn't work on, on those particular questions, but, uh, but yeah, there, there are uh, changes in the genome that can occur. There, those are typically difficult to find just because um, uh, there aren't a lot of them. And because there are very few, um, it, it, ends up being, it ends up just being difficult to do whole genome sequencing and find these over a period of time. Um, but there are, there's a, a, a lot of population genetics and quantitative genetics that can be done to be able to um, figure out how big the effect of these mutations are over time. And C. elegans is a great system because it takes about three days to uh, make a population of individuals. And th those three days uh, allow you to be able to do a large number of generations over the course of a, of a year, let's say. Um, and that, that, that means that uh, things can be, you can control these things very easily. You can get things to work well for laboratory evolution. So, so what kind of um, phenotype correlations have you seen? Is it the, in the a very conserved part of the, you know, the nematode's genome? Like what, what kind of correlations do you see? Yeah, so we, we, when I first started my lab seven years ago, uh, we focused on different types of toxin, uh, chemotherapeutics, heavy metals, um, and other compounds to be able to look at 
different responses across the, the population of, of C. elegans that we were focused at the time. Um, and we have mapped a, a bunch of these to specific genes. And even in those genes, we've identified the specific variant or the, the, ex, the exact nucleotide position in the genome that's causing this change. So in, in many of these, we, we were focused on variants that affect the protein coding sequence of the genes. So essentially a variant or a mutation that would change the amino acid from one to another. Uh, and, and in a lot of those cases, they were in conserved genes. So in, in one of the first examples we have in the lab, we mapped responses to a chemotherapeutic called etoposide. And etoposide is a, a chemotherapeutic that's actually one of the first chemotherapeutics ever found. Uh, and it's, uh, it's known to bind to and inhibit the function of a topoisomerase, essentially uh, an enzyme that unwinds pieces of DNA. And we identified a topoisomerase or differences, natural differences in a topoisomerase across the worm population that, uh, that lead to differences in response to a toposide. Uh, and that's cool because that means that's the same drug target and there's differences in the drug target. But what made it even more interesting was that the exact mutation that we identified in this gene is the same change that humans have between the two versions of this gene. So in, in worms, we've got one topoisomerase, two of this type. Um, in, in humans, we have two of them of this type. And uh, the change that we identified actually differentiates these two types in humans. And for the last 30 years, it was a mystery about why these two different forms of, of the gene um, have differential responses to a toposide. And what we were able to show um, using some molecular genetics and some biochemistry and some molecular modeling is that the, the difference in this one particular mutation uh, uh, defines the energy for how the drug can interact with the specific enzyme. And then that gives us the ability to make predictions about how uh, human cells can respond to different types of chemotherapeutic treatments. We can essentially say, if you have this one mutation, you're going to respond in very strongly to this chemo. Whereas if you have the other one, you'll respond less strongly. Um, and that is predictive of how well the chemotherapeutic can treat a cancer, but also how severe side effects can be for a particular pa human patient. Um, and that was one of the, the first studies we dug into. But we've also done this for, for other chemotherapeutics, again, for heavy metals, for anti-nematode compounds called anthelmintics, uh, and, and, and so on. So in, in many of these cases, just to generally answer your question, um, they're affecting the protein content of the amino acids that make up that a particular enzyme or a particular uh, protein. Are you seeing one sequence equals one gene, or is a given sequence shared and acts in different ways depending on where you start and where you end in it? Is there overlap, you know, of what's called a gene in the nematode? Overlap with human? No, overlap in itself. Like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to, like, how long is the uh, nematode genome? How many base pairs is it? Yeah, so C. elegans is 100 million base pairs long. Okay, so like if I take, I don't know, I'll just start with 1 to 10,000. If that's a gene, could you also see a gene that's comprised of 100 to 10,100? You know, meaning like with the same sequence, area, overlap, and be responsible for uh, what you would call multiple genes? Or is it, uh, uh, you know, a given part of the sequence is only used and transcribed in one way I see. Yeah, so so C. elegans, like many organisms, has uh, genes organized on on uh, essentially the direction of transcription would go in in, uh, in opposite directions um, on the two strands, so on the Watson or the Crick strand of the DNA. So there are some regions of the genome where if you were to take nucleotide position 10,000 from your example, that might overlap with gene A that's going in uh, whatever towards the center of the chromosome, but it also could overlap with gene B that's going towards the end of the chromosome, but they're just on Watson and Crick strands, so they go in opposite directions. Does that answer your question? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Well, partially, it's a direction you can get different gene expression, but what about, again, if, if, uh, if I'm just taking like 1 to 100, is there another gene that transcribes 50 to 150? So we've got overlap of about 50 of the base pairs, but now we're calling it two different genes, or it is two different genes. Does that yeah, happen? Yeah, that, that doesn't happen very much. The, the, the cases where it would happen would be um, alternative splicing, so different 
different transcriptional units that could be made from, from one, one gene might overlap with another gene on the kind of edges of those transcriptional units. Um, or if, if some of the genes are small RNAs or non-coding RNAs, those, because they're small, they tend to also overlap uh, with protein coding genes. So that would be another case where that might happen. Uh, and in our, in our searches to identify these variants that are correlated with a trait of interest, uh, we, we will look at the genome at that particular position to see if there are any of these uh, examples of kind of uh, alternatively transcribed genes you know, on the Watson or Crick strands, uh, or whether we see non-coding RNAs that could explain this difference. And uh, actually, in one of our experiments, we did find that, uh, that small RNAs could explain this difference rather than the protein coding change. Um, but it's only been in, in one, of our, uh, one of our traits so far that we've mapped. But yeah, we, we, do, we do look for what you're describing here, which would be cases in which um, one transcriptional product could overlap with another transcriptional product, um, and a variant or a mutation in the genome could affect multiple of these products. What about, uh, so in the nematode sequence, do we understand what every part of the sequence does, or is there a large part that's unexplained as to what it does? Yeah, the, the nice thing about uh, working on C. elegans uh, specifically is that it is the most well understood animal genome of all animal genomes. So from the first base pair to the last base pair of every chromosome, uh, we know every one of those base pairs, there are no gaps left, whereas the human genome still has hundreds of gaps. Um, and we, based upon the last 40 years of, of research by tens of thousands of researchers, we know uh, a large amount about every transcriptional unit, the locations of uh, histones and where they might bind to be able to regulate gene expression, uh, modifications to those histones, transcription factors where they bind. So um, a lot of the data sets that have been generated for human biology to understand, let's say, where a gene is and where, when a gene gets turned on and what transcription factors might turn on that particular gene, um, a lot of that work was first based, uh, or essentially was, was, was optimized and first uh, 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 put together based upon uh, research in C. elegans. So the nice thing, and that's actually true for the Human Genome as well. The Human Genome Project, before it was the Human Genome Project, was actually the C. elegans Genome Project. The same people who made the, human, uh, made the C. elegans Genome, Bob Watterson and John Fulston and others, went on to do the Human Genome uh, after they learned all the lessons from the C. elegans genome. So not only from the genome, but also, again, transcription factors, histones, binding sites, all that stuff has been very well characterized uh, across the C. elegans genome. Uh, and, and so therefore, yes, we, we do know an awful lot about it, which makes, which makes my life so much easier when we're looking at these correlations between the genome and a phenotype of interest, because um, it really is the only animal that you can kind of look at it and, and try to read it as close as we can to be in a book. So how much of that can be mapped <clears throat> to the human genome? I know the context is different because our sequence is, is different, but I would think that a lot of the sequence is the same, or is it all totally different? Yeah, so about 60% of the genes in C. elegans have an ortholog or uh, a, 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 a gene in the human genome that matches pretty closely with it. So we can essentially, it, within those, that 60% of the genes within C. elegans, we, we can make a direct relationship between anything we identify and we're able to, to show a, a causal connection logically by experiment in C. elegans. We can connect that to a, a human gene that likely does the same thing. Um, and you know, over the last, again, 40 years or so that C. elegans has been a, a model system, this has been shown repeatedly to be the case where many of the primary basic science discoveries of the late 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, were eventually found to be true within humans, and a lot of the biology of cancer and RNAi and development all came from C. elegans uh, during the early part of that model organism. So yeah, it's about, it's about 60% um, has that direct relationship. And it sounds like <clears throat> C. elegans has epigenetics. It has... Um... I mean, does it have, it has histone modification and has methylation just like uh, human DNA does, or does it have epigenetics? Yeah, so for, for at least uh, chromatin modification, C. elegans definitely has histones, and they have uh, uh, transcriptional regulation modified by histones that can be uh, inherited across generations. They do not have DNA methylation, so uh, C. elegans and a, and a large number of nematodes 
have lost the DNA methylation mechanisms. So transcriptional regulation at that level is not present. Uh, and yeah, so for that reason, we don't have a, a, a multi-generational inheritance uh, as mediated by DNA methylation. Um, but certainly on the histone and chromatin side of things, that, that has been shown. Well, can you selectively breed C. elegans to go along a certain path? And will it retain, you know, your selective breeding over many, many generations? Huh. So in terms of, of uh, taking a particular trait, selecting for that trait over the course of a large number of generations and, and seeing a change? Right, yes. Yep. Yeah, so you, you can certainly do that. Um, so some groups have um, evolved the elegans to be able to respond to different types of pathogens uh, more quickly or to grow faster. Um, uh, and and yeah, so, so that, that certainly has been done. I don't, at this point, it hasn't been done too extensively at the level of uh, drugs or responses to kind of natural secreted compounds from bacteria and fungi. Um, but, uh, but that's certainly one of the things I know that the field is interested in doing as well. So yes, it, again, the nice thing about C. elegans is they, they grow so quickly that um, it's, it wouldn't be a difficult thing to be able to do this over the course of, or of hundreds of generations. The other nice thing about C. elegans too is that they can grow in liquid culture like you would grow bacteria or yeast. So you essentially can grow up hundreds of thousands of animals um, within a typical flask and you can grow many tens of flasks over the short period of time to be able to get a very, very large population size. And, and having a large population allows for these kind of rare events and rare mutations to be able to uh, be present and then hopefully uh, selected over the course of generations. So um, it is definitely a, a nice laboratory evolution system for those, for those reasons. Since, um, I mean, they do have some degree of epigenetics, how do you know that um, it's not just governed only by sequence, you know, the phenotype? Like, how would you evaluate if there's something going on with, uh, you know, the chromatin modification that that's not responsible for, you know, a different outcome and not just the underlying sequence. Yeah, so we, we use genome editing, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, to be able to take uh, one particular strain that does not have that variant of interest um, and to add that specific variant into that strain. And then we then score it in the same trait or assay that we've done uh, to be able to identify that variant in the first place. And um, in, in every case that we've done so far, this has recapitulated the response. If it were a transgenerational effect, uh, then you would predict that we would have to let it uh, grow or, um, or for that variant to be present for a long period of time before we start to see the effect. And so far, that, that hasn't been the case. Um, I think in, in, in many examples, um, and I'll say something slightly controversial, I would say that, that transgenerational effects and, and what, what some people call epigenetics um, are oftentimes difficult to control and therefore poorly controlled um, in many laboratory experiments. So um, it's, it's, uh, there, are very, there are very few concrete examples of kind of looking at these long-term multi-generational effects. C. elegans has a couple of nice examples where that happens. Um, and where the, essentially this, this memory of transcription can be carried for long periods of time. Um, but for us, essentially, the, 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 the genome editing to be able to add in that particular location in the genome and then the recapitulation of whatever the trait difference that we found from our correlation test um, in our genome edited strain is what we use as proof to say that this is the, the right variant involved in response. I suppose if we did not see uh, the effect that we predicted from the editing, we probably would say that we got the wrong gene and we would move on to the wrong gene rather than throwing in a, a, a transgenerational effect. Um, but but it, it would be formally possible that we wouldn't be, that, that we would not have captured the transgenerational response, whatever that might have been. Well, um, if you look at other worms that are extremely similar to C. elegans, but different, I don't know, do you, do you see that uh, your CRISPR-Cas9 attempts resemble the natural variation or the natural change that they undergo? Like, like how do you choose targets, you know, to, to edit the genome? What are you basing that on? Yeah, we're, we're basing that on the original correlation test that we do, right? So we, we correlate the genotype difference with the phenotype difference. That brings us to a particular gene. And then at that point, we look at that gene to be able to see what variants or mutations are present in that gene uh, and, and whether we think those could be affecting the function of that particular gene. And in some cases, well, in, actually in many cases in C. elegans, there aren't that many changes for a particular genes. So we only really need to edit one or maybe two sites to be able to see if those one or two sites 
play a role in the, the trait difference that we saw across our population. There have been examples where there are a large number of variants in a particular gene, and then you're right, how do you choose which one it should be? But typically when you see those situations, that those are examples where um, what we say in evolution, that there's been loss of purifying selection for that particular gene, which means that evolutionarily, the function of that gene, once it, once it got a mutation that changed the function of the gene, any additional mutations, we're not going to break it any further than the ones than the first one did. So it essentially starts to drift and accumulate a large number of variants over time. So that typically suggests to us that that gene has lost its inherent function. And then we can test that the role of that gene just by deleting it using, again, this, this targeted genome editing technique with CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so, so yeah, so we, we get to it based upon the statistics. And then after the statistics, we do a variety of crosses to be able to make sure that that region of the genome does play a role in the trait difference. And then we move on to genome editing to, uh, to edit uh, the particular genes that, that might be in that genomic interval and to figure out which ones are correlated with the response. When you do your, your CRISPR-Cas9 cuts, are you doing it right where one gene ends? And uh, like how are you doing it? Are you just changing one nucleotide in a given gene? Or what, what kind of changes do you make and where? Yes. So when, when we identify a gene that has uh, one or two variants in that particular gene, then we will do a specific nucleotide change um, in, in, in just that example. Um, so we'll, we'll only change one position. In, in examples where the gene might have, uh, might have a large number of variants or mutations across its sequence, in those cases, then we will, uh, based upon the limitations of CRISPR-Cas9, which at this point there are, there are not many, it's a pretty amazing tool, um, we'll, we'll typically target and delete um, much of the coding sequence for the gene, um, ensuring that it does not overlap with other genes that might be nearby uh, uh, that, particular, or that particular locus. So um, yeah, so essentially either we make a, a, we make a large deletion that, we, that will specifically uh, in, uh, knock out something about that gene sequence, or in most cases, what we do is we edit one position within them, just one nucleotide. Mm, okay. Um, what are some of the big surprises or the big realizations that you've gotten from doing this work? You know, what have you figured out that, uh, I don't know, it's like particularly instructive to you? Yeah. So I, I, part of what, what excites me about doing this work is that there, there have not been very many empirical examples of differences across a population that can be narrowed down to a specific gene and a specific variant within that gene to understand how did evolution essentially affect a change across a population. And we have a number of those examples that we've identified over the years. Um, it's been surprising to me that uh, we, we, we've actually been relatively successful. I think when I first started the whole endeavor, I thought we'd do you know, maybe a gene or two and a trait or two every year. Um, but based upon the, the kind of high throughput pipelines and computational techniques that my lab has built, uh, we've been able to identify a larger number than that. And, uh, and we continue to expand the, the purview of, of, of changes that the genome can undergo um, to different classes. So not just protein coding changes, but now gene expression changes or metabolite changes or protein expression changes. Um, and uh, and ultimately, again, learning more about how uh, genomes can change. So it's been kind of surprising to see how, how well a lot of this has worked. The other thing that's been crazy and, and a lot of fun is that this little worm uh, found in mushroom compost back in 1951 kind of changed the research community and it's been this, the, the basis for, as I said, many thousands of people who've discovered these fundamental aspects of biology. Uh, but oftentimes we don't know a lot about this, the natural context of the organism. And my lab and other labs go out there into the world and try to find the elegans uh, in, in its natural environment. And it's been great over the last few years to learn more about where it lives, what it likes to eat, uh, and, and uh, just, just what, what parts of the genome can allow it to adapt to particular places in the world. Um, so yeah, so I guess, that's been a lot of fun. And then, and generally just thinking about how genomes can work uh, and the elegant genome gives us examples where we can, we can again use genome editing to test uh, the structure of genomes and how just, not just single nucleotide changes, but how other larger effects to a genome can impact uh, function and behavior and adaptability of, of this organism. When, um, you know, when the nematodes 
evolve on their own or when you see just different phenotypes of different nematodes, what kind of changes do you see amongst their genomes? And is that very different from what you're trying to create? Like, what can you learn from that natural variation of them? Yes. Yeah, so so we're, we're focused primarily on the natural variation side of things. So we, um, we see, we see a, a, a variety of changes. So they're getting single nucleotide changes. Uh, we see short deletions and insertions of, of, of DNA into a particular sequence. My lab's also investigated transposons, these little mobile pieces of DNA that can hop around genomes. We see how those are different across the species. Uh, we've also focused on short tandem repeats. These are essentially, let's say, one to five base pair long repeats that might go AGA, AGA, AGA. That would be a three base pair short tandem repeat. We see that those are also different across genomes. Um, and recently, we started to focus and and uh, and, and investigate more about very large changes in genomes. So inversions of big parts of the chromosome, translocations where one chromosome might be stuck onto another chromosome, uh, and very large deletions and insertions. So we're, we're starting to characterize these a bit more, and this is, I think, going to be one of the big growth areas of my group over the next five to 10 years is, as we start to investigate how much these very large changes to a genome can impact uh, the phenotype or the different traits that we see uh, in the lab. Okay. Um, what, what do you think will be the, um, I don't know, the future of understanding for your work, you know, in the near term and then maybe a few more years out? Where are you taking this? Yeah, so uh, as I was just kind of slightly alluding to there, um, one direction, so we've got a correlation between genotype and phenotype, as I was telling you from the very beginning. So on one side of it, on the genome side of it, in the next five to 10 years, the technology is increasing at an amazing rate, we're gonna have far more accurate genomes using longer sequence reads that allow us to understand genetic differences across populations far better than we have now. We'll be able to sequence more cheaply large numbers of individuals that we've collected from nature. So uh, my lab is gonna continue, and other labs are continuing to go out and identify uh, more C. elegans strains, more Cenerobditis uh, species, uh, and other species in the nematode clade and to using sequencing technologies to understand the genetic differences across these individuals. So on the genotype side, that's going to be a massive growth area. Again, it just changes in the accuracy and the, the length of the sequences that are coming out of nowadays. On the phenotyping side of things, with computer vision and with a lot of the imaging technologies that are going on now, uh, we are getting far more powerful platforms to be able to, to actually look at the worms uh, uh, and to take pictures of of different parts of the animal, of internal structures and cell positions, and, and also just to look at freely behaving worms that can move around on a plate uh, in the laboratory or in liquid, that can swim in liquid, um, and learning more about their behaviors. So I think it's going to be kind of those two growth areas of, of better genomes and better phenotypes, and it's going to allow us to be able to dig uh, more into these types of correlations of phenotype and phenotype. Uh, and, and to learn more about, again, how evolution could have shaped differences across the species. And the, the final bit is that uh, my lab is pretty deeply invested now in not just the elegans, but using the same types of tools, the same types of populations, but branching out into other nematode species like Cenerobditis brigsby, Cenerobditis tropicalis, um, and beyond into parasitic nematode species. So doing kind of comparative mapping approaches, these correlation tests, and, and, but comparing them across different species uh, within the nematode uh, phylum that I think will, will allow us to be able to understand more about how parasitic nematodes become resistant to drugs, and even more generally just how nematodes as, a, as, as, as their different clades have evolved over time. Oh, just quick, quick, quick definition, what is a clade? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it, it means many different things to different people. So. So in, in this, uh, in, in my example, I'm saying um, in, in the nematode phylum, uh, there are a number of clades that have been defined. So a clade in this case are genetically similar uh, uh, species that, um, based upon uh, evolutionary time, have a, a, a recent common ancestor that can be traced back uh, to to. Uh, to define when they, they were at one point similar to each other, but then they've now diverged. Uh, but they have not diverged as, as much as individuals that are in a different clade. So a clade is a, a group of related individuals or related species to each other. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Eric, uh, 
what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and to perhaps get in contact? Yeah, I, I think the, the best would be to check out uh, our lab's website and just read some of the basic descriptions there and check out any of our papers and uh, or shoot me an email. And I'm happy to, uh, to talk about these things as well. Well, very good. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.